Hello, this is Chris Duncan here. I'm Master on the Canum, and I'm also with Find Your Focus Photographic Education. I want to thank you for joining us on this little chat today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today we're going to continue our series on the art and science of lighting and focusing mainly on exposure. How to obtain the correct exposure, the different methods to do that, understanding what proper exposure really is, and also a little insight into our dynamic range and how we can use that and how our eye will oftentimes trick us on what we see is not what we can capture and it's definitely not what we can print. So we're gonna we're gonna dive into that in this little segment today. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll do a screen share here. <clears throat> And so I like starting with this quote. This is a quote I found from Ansel Adams, and you don't even have to be a landscape photographer to appreciate this. He says, I often thought of that photography were difficult in the true sense of the term, meaning the creation of a photograph would entail as much time and effort as a production as a watercolor or etching. There would be a vast improvement in total output. The sheer ease at which a superficial image can be created often leads to creative disaster. I think that's a very powerful quote. Um, this was taken, this was said in an age when it wasn't as easy to create a superficial image. Now it was easier than a watercolor and etching was, but it still wasn't at the ease that we have it today. And it's going to be even easier tomorrow to create an image. So I think as professional photographers and as creatives and as artists, um, it's our job to, to really take our time and show the world what we want them to see in a, in a manner that makes sense, in a manner that works. And especially if it's our, if our business or if it's our art, um, this isn't something we can just flippantly do. I think it takes some time and some effort. And uh, in this next few minutes, I'm gonna be going over some of the art and the science of lighting. And so maybe we can put those in the back of our mind. So before we pull the trigger, we have everything in place. So this quote may, may or may not necessarily go exactly along with today's, but I think it's a big umbrella that covers everything we should do. So let's understand light first. <clears throat> and basically when we're talking about understanding light or getting to learn these things, we have three levels of learning. And I, and I talk about this at every seminar and classroom setting I have. And that's there's three levels of this gaining of knowledge or of learning. First is knowledge. Knowledge is just the facts. That's just the information. Um, for example, I know that my car needs fuel and oil. I know that whenever it's on, the, the spark plug causes a spark that allows the gasoline to explode, that pushes the pistons, and this explodes multiple times in a second. And this drives the pistons, and the more it explodes, the more pressure is built up, the faster my car can go. I know when I apply the brake that I use friction to stop the car. I know that. I don't understand how any of it works. If my car breaks down and I have to look inside an engine, I'm totally lost. So a lot of people, maybe you watching, you know some things about lighting, but you don't understand why it's doing what it's doing or what it's doing. And so I want to take you from the thing of knowing the facts. I'll give you some facts. I'll give you some of the knowledge. I want to take you beyond that to where you have a true understanding of what it's doing. So you can get to a situation and, for instance, say, wow, this is a nice big light source, so I know it's really soft. I don't need a soft source because my bride has a very detailed dress. I want to show all those details, so I need to have more shadow detail. So I need to make my light source smaller, so I'm going to move it farther away. That's the kind of understanding I want you to have that you can do like that in the just flip the switch and subconsciously not even really have to think about it and then create the image you need for your client. And of course, wisdom is something we're all gaining for, we're all, we're all striving for, and that's using the knowledge and the understanding and the right combination to create the image that's best suited for our client or for what we want the world to see. Today, we're going to talk about exposure, mainly, and but there's a big difference. There is a difference between a properly exposed photograph, and this is what I think when people say, man, your camera takes good pictures, or man, my camera's doing a great job. I think they're mainly looking at exposure. Is the color right? Did the highlights and shadows match? Um, is every, all the detail there? And yes, we need properly exposed photographs. But I've seen a lot of just boring, properly exposed photographs of the pyramids. 
And I've seen amazing images of trees or branches or of a rock. So there's a big difference between a properly exposed photograph and a well-lit image. And we could go on to say a well-designed, a well-posed, a well-composed, a well-colored, a well-focused, a well-put-together image. It's not just about getting an exposure right. It's about doing all these things together. And today we're going to focus on exposure. Light has three properties that we need to be aware of at all times. That is light quantity. That is how much light do we have? Is there enough? Is there too much? What do we need to do to get just the right amount of light for our scene? Light quality. What does it look like? Is it hard? Is it soft? Keep in mind, light quality is the, is the hardness or softness of the light, not the density of the shadow. A lot of, a lot of my students get confused on this. You can have soft light and very deep shadows. Light quality refers to the transition between the highlight area to the midtone to the shadow area. Is it very sharp? Is it a quick line that you would get with a small light source like the sun? Does that shadow have a crisp edge? Or is it a gradual transition from highlight to shadow? Is it feathered? That'd be softer light quality. And then of course we need light direction. Where's it coming from? Is it producing shadows? Is it producing shape and form and texture? So what does light do? Well, the main thing of lighting is probably not what you might have originally thought. Lighting makes up for what our eye can see, our sensor can capture, and our paper can print. That's why we use lighting in the film industry. That's why we use lighting in the photography industry. It is to make up for what our eye can see, our sensor can capture, and our paper can print. That's what it needs to do. That's what it has to do. What it can do is provide texture, dimension, color. You know, proper exposure. The only way to get proper exposure, sorry, the only way to get proper color is by proper exposure. If you overexpose red, you get pink. If you underexpose red, you get maroon. If you want red, you better expose it properly and are correctly. Light also shows a shape, emotion, and direction. And the list could go on and on. The same model, the same scene, same outfit, different lighting. This is what I'm talking about. Both of these are well-exposed photographs. They both have different messages. And they both have different feels that the viewer um, is going to take away from it. I'm a firm believer that if I'd lit the photograph on the left, the same way I'd lit the photograph on the right, it would not make sense. Not with her pose, not with her expression. Now with that sweet kind of innocent look, it need to be it need to have a softer, more brighter type of light to fit that scene. Same goes for the image on the right. If I had lit that the way I had lit the one on the left, if I just said, okay, now let's sit down and did the same thing again, it wouldn't fit. It'd just be another pose in her book. But by gritting those lights and changing the light direction and changing the light quality and the light quantity, I was able to, in my opinion, create an image and a lighting that fits the mood and the style of the scene. Another example, same model, same scene, same lighting setup. It is the same lighting setup. All I did was add a gel to the background light. I don't think a yellow gel behind her image on the left would look good with that powerful, confident pose. This fun, laughing, smiling pose, that's a bright, sunshiny look. That I think that fits. One more example. This is I just moved my camera position. I didn't really necessarily change the lighting. I just moved my camera direction. And sometimes all you got to do is walk around and it changes. It's not necessarily pulling off a modifier or putting a grid on a light. It could just be moving your feet a little. Now this is a landscape image we took at our Find Your Focus event. Um, this is kind of, this is a little sidetrack. I'm going to go and go through the slide, but it's, it's really to think cinematically. And this is great when you're doing landscapes. If you do wedding albums or family settings, get the big cinema makers, we'll call it the ELS, the establishing long shot. It sets the scene. It's a two second to four second clip before they get into the dialogue. It kind of tells the viewer where they are. 
then they get a little more intimate into the details. They'll come into the room that maybe maybe the cinema, the street, the scene is the ELS is a street scene. Then it's a room in this building, and then it's into the dialogue. So then you're getting closer to the subject matter. Just a little side note to keep you to keep things intriguing. So one thing we got to think about the laws of lighting, especially in exposure today, is our main topic, is we measure exposure in stops. A stop is just a term of measurement, like an inch or an ounce is. But one difference with this is exposure is exponential. It's not a sequential measurement. So it's not one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on and so on. It's one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, and so on and so on. So each stop doubles or halves the amount of light we have. That's why it goes from 2 to 4 to 8. We're doubling it, or from 8 to 4 to 2, we're cutting it in half. And we can control our stops by three methods. Our ISO, which is a global stop change. We can keep the same look with our shutter speed and aperture and use the ISO to globally change our exposure. Or we can more selectively change our exposure, which affects the image output via shutter speed, which will show or stop motion, or via aperture, which will com com combine more depth of field or less depth of field. And I can test to you today that we have an exposure latitude of one half stop. That means you can miss your exposure by about a half a stop. Um, yes, you can probably miss it more and recover some details, but when you do that, something else is given. You're either going to lose sharpness to regain a highlight. You're going to lose contrast to open up a shadow. You're going to lose detail. You're going to introduce noise. Something is going to give in your software um, to adjust for that. So the closer we can be in our exposure right off the bat, the better. If we can start with a good base image, then we can use all of our post-processing time to enhance and finish our image instead of correcting mistakes that we failed to take care of the first time. So here's this image of this barn. And I've got two terms on the bottom, correct exposure and proper exposure. And this is something that I think can be confusing at first uh, for some newer artists and newer photographers. Exposure basically means getting the right amount of light to show proper tone, texture, and shape of an object. So I would ask you, what in this scene is correctly exposed. Is anything in the scene correctly exposed? Let me let me take that a little further. If I had correctly exposed for the sky, which is very bright, I would have all the mountains would have been dark. That would have been the correct exposure for the sky, sunny 16, right? The the um the the mountains and the barn would be just black. If I'd exposed for the, the backside of those mountains, then I would have lost my sky, even though this, the mountains would be correctly exposed to show the true color, shape, and form of that landscape, I would lose any detail I have in the sky. So the only correct exposure in this image is the right side of the barn. That is the proper color, tone, and texture of that barn on that right side. The rest of it kind of falls into place. So I had to check, I had to, I had to find a correct exposure in the scene that would allow the whole scene to be properly exposed and hold all the details from my highlight to my shadow. This is not an HDR image. This is a single image. I did end up using a graduated filter on the top to help control a little bit more of the sky. But the point of this is there's only one part of this image that's correctly exposed. But the whole image works together to make it one properly exposed image. Like I said, this is a difficult concept for many to grasp at first. Just bear with me, and it's all going to make sense at the end. So, when we're talking exposure, and what we can see based on that first that image we just saw, our eye sees a 24 stop range. That means we can see lots of stuff. Our eye is going to fool us. It's going to adjust for highlight and shadow where we can take it all in. Our camera will capture about a seven stop range, and we can really ignore that part. It really doesn't matter what our camera can capture. Because we're photographers, we're image makers, we put things on paper. John Sexton said it best, he goes, 
the world changes when you put something on paper. Whether that's a, an author writing down a book, whether that's a letter you write to your kids, whether it's um, a print that you make for a family, whether it's a goal you set for yourself, whenever something's on paper, things change. So we need to print our work. But we know that 18% is the middle grade. The reason it's 18 is because, remember, we're on an exponential scale, not a sequential scale. So 18 is the middle. And we have a five-stop range, two stops on either side of that 18% grade that we can contain on our paper. If we go up in lights, we go to 36%. That's our light gray. And if we go up another stop, double that, we're at 72%. That's our white with detail. Go on the other side of the scale from middle gray, we go down a stop, we go to dark, we go to dark gray or nine percent, and another stop, four and a half is our black with detail. So if you look at this image on the right of this man, you will see the middle gray is right there, about the edge of his nose. That our left, his right side of his nose. That's my middle gray. So I have a four and a half percent on his collar, that's the black with detail in his hair. I've got a 72% of white with detail in his beard and in the white white of his hair. And my 9% and my 36% grays just kind of fall into place. And so I'm talking about correct exposure and proper exposure. I had to base my correct exposure on 18% middle gray. And then I had to light it in a way that all the other things were still there, that I didn't look go beyond four and a half percent and I didn't go above 72%. So I couldn't have set my exposure on his collar, on his right collar, his left collar, our right side of the image. I could have not accept my exposure there because if I'd have made that my middle gray, then I would have lost all white detail in his face and in his beard. Conversely, I couldn't have set my exposure on his white hair or his beard as my middle gray because then I would have pushed all. For one, my whites would have been not white with detail. They'd have been gray. And I would have made all those deep, deep blacks just go away. It had just been blocked up with no, no detail in there. So it's very critical where we base our exposure of and how we light it to make the other values around 18% gray fall into place. So let's determine exposure. We know that 18% is the middle gray. We can do that a few ways. We can use our in-camera meter. It's reflective. It measures the light bouncing off a subject and back into our camera. And our camera is designed to make it 18% gray. We can use an incident or a handheld meter. This measures the light striking the subject, not reflecting off of it. So it only cares about the light that is there, not what's bouncing around, just the light that's there. So I did an experiment. I had a black shirt, a gray shirt, and a white shirt. I did not have an iron for this project, but then I wanted you to be able to see texture. This is also laid out like your histogram is, left to right, black to white. So if you look, we have black with detail, we have middle gray with detail, and we have white with detail. Properly and correct exposed images. I took my incident light meter and I put it on the spot. You can read that it's all a thirtieth of a second at f4. I set my camera to a thirtieth of a second at f4, and I photographed each one of those shirts. Okay. So that's what I know it should be. But I wanted to see what my camera would do if it worked like it's supposed to. So I set it on aperture priority at F4, and it was going to select the shutter speed that was appropriate for me. No exposure or compensation. I pointed at the 18% gray shirt, and it does exactly what it's designed to do. It gives me 18% gray, and my shirt looks great. But then I get a problem when I go to something that's not 18% gray. I meter my black shirt. Even though that white card is in there, that's still part of the scene. It sees that overall scene as being black. And my camera worked exactly like it was designed to do. The meter did its job. It made my black shirt 18% gray. But it didn't give me a correct exposure. It overexposed by two and a half stops. I then looked at my white shirt. Once again, the engineers at Canon nailed it. The meter worked exactly like it was supposed to do. It made my white shirt gray. And it, un and it underexposed it by two stops. So I'm not saying you can't use a reflective meter, but you need to understand what it's metering and what information it's giving you off what part of the scene.
Is it reading gray? If it is, you're fine. Is it reading a white or a black? If it's reading one of those to make its exposure determination, then you're going to be frustrated and fighting an uphill battle. Same goes for ETTL flash technology. It's the same method. It just, it just measures the flash bouncing off either a black, gray, or white tone. So you need to be careful using ETTL technology as well. If you are going to use a reflective meter, I recommend in your camera that you set it to spot metering so you can get the, the most pinpoint part of a scene to meter off of and find something that's 18% gray to meter off of if you're going to be using a reflective metering technique. Of course, then I did my incident meter. You've already seen these, that it worked properly. So I leave it up to you which is a preferred method. I like to use an incident meter. Now there are times it's not practical and you can't do that all the time. Sporting events, for example. So the green grass, this artificial green grass, it's at sport fields now, that is 18% gray. Meter the field that's in the light, not in the shadow part, that's in the light, and get base your exposure off that. Now, So now if you have black jerseys and white jerseys, everyone's going to be properly exposed and in the tonal range they need to be. So why is a handheld meter or an incident meter preferred method? Well, as a professional photographer, it's because of this. I have clients that come in like this. Black and white, their colors are gray and blue. There's green, there's bright stuff in the background. There's light coming in there. It's all over the board as far as what my camera would read. I take one meter reading, and as long as they're in this setting, I know my exposure and I don't have to do anything. I can now... Interact with my client, I can now change poses and all that, and I don't have to worry about exposure bouncing off all over the place, determining where my camera is set. So I can set it on manual and forget it. And of course, the classic example is a bride and groom. As you can see there, we have white with detail, black with detail, and all of our other mid-tones fall into place as well. Or if you're a commercial photographer using studio lighting, then this this would confuse the heck out of ETTL unless you were savvy enough to know that that red of those cherries is 18% gray and you'd meter off of that. But I've got a white dish, a deep dark chocolate cake, and a red cherry. So I in this image I have my white with detail, a black with detail, and an 18% gray which is represented by the red. So if you are using reflective metering, look for this color of red and that'll also render an 18% gray to your camera. So, I am going to stop there for today's lesson. That's enough to kind of give you a good understanding of exposure and some things to think about um, when you're metering a scene and things to look for. Critical part of this lesson was knowing your metering method. Are you using the camera, using the reflective metering? Are you going to use a tool like this um, that you can trust? Um, and if you are using a reflective meter, make sure you're metering off something that is 18% gray. And really be aware of the next scene you're at, whether it be a portrait, a wedding, a landscape, whatever the scene is. Really be cognizant of the entire dynamic range. From your 4.5%, your black with detail, up to your 72%, your white with detail. Make sure you can take, you can control your image and your exposure to all of that. Because your eye may see this. Your eye may be way out here. And the scene may call for this. So you have to do something with lighting, camera position, either adding light or removing light, whatever the case may be, and you have to narrow that gap to that five stop range. So that's kind of the that's kind of the goal and, and the, the meat of the information from today. So I hope this helps you um, when you're out photographing and you're out lighting a scene and checking it. So um, those are some critical things to think about. Once again, my name is Chris Duncan with Find Your Focus Photographic Education. You can also find me on the Arcanum where I'm a master there in my own community. I appreciate you watching today and happy creating.